judgment in Newfield, Carlisle and Royal Bank of Scotland. Lord Hodge will explain the decision of the court. Mr Carlisle was a property developer. In 2007, he wanted to develop houses beside the famous golf course at Glen Eagles in Perthshire. He needed finance from a bank to pursue that venture. Because the Ryder Cup was to be held at the Glen Eagles course, the sellers of the land wanted the purchaser to complete the, the exterior of the development well in advance, so that there were no incomplete houses visible when the world's media came to film the contest. To achieve that, the sellers wished to include in the contract of sale a clause which provided that, if the development was not completed by the 31st of March 2011, they would be able to buy back the land at the price which the purchaser had paid for it. Such a buyback would have very serious financial consequences for the purchaser. Because of this, Mr Carlyle wanted to obtain a commitment from his bankers, the Royal Bank of Scotland, that they would, not, that they would fund not only the purchase of the site, but also its development. In discussions with the bank's representatives between March and June 2007, he made this clear and the bank acknowledged his request. On the 14th of June 2007, a bank representative, representative telephoned him to tell him that it was all approved. On the strength of that assurance, he paid the deposit and entered into the contract to buy the land. In August 2008, after the financial crisis had taken hold, the bank informed Mr. Carlyle that they would not uh, advance uh, funds to develop the site. Shortly afterwards, the bank raised an action against him for repayment of the £1.4 million which it had advanced. Mr. Carlyle defended the action and claimed damages, arguing that the bank were in breach of contract uh, to provide him with funding of up to £700,000 for the development. The case proceeded to proof, and in May 2010, the Lord Ordinary, Lord Glenny, after hearing the evidence, held that the telephone conversation of 14th June 2007, in the context of the previous discussions, amounted to a binding promise to advance both the purchase price of the land and funding for the development. The bank appealed, and in September 2013, the inner house of the Court of Session allowed the appeal, holding that the telephone conversation had amounted only to a report of an internal decision of the bank to approve funding in principle. Mr. Carlyle appealed to this court. In a unanimous decision, this court allows the appeal. In the judgment of the court, uh, the, uh, in, in, the, in its judgment, the court notes the limited power of an appeal court to reverse the findings of fact of a judge at first instance and the need to show that the judge has gone plainly wrong. This court expresses the view that on the recorded evidence, it might have concluded that the bank had not entered into a binding promise to provide the development funding, but it states that there was, uh, in the unusual circumstances of this case, a reasonable basis in the evidence for the Lord Ordinary to have reached the view which he did on an objective analysis of what the parties said and did. Therefore, this court considers that the judge had not gone plainly wrong. The fact that the commitment lacked detail and would have been superseded by a detailed loan agreement did not of itself prevent the commitment from having legal effect. Once the Lord Ordinary was satisfied that there was a binding promise, he was both entitled and required to look for ways to give effect to that promise. <laughs>